Hello. So today we're going to be talking about Discolos by Menander. Um, Discolos is one of the most important ancient Greek plays because it's the only surviving example that we have of what's called new comedy. Uh, so Menander was the guy when it came to new comedy and in my forthcoming video about Menander himself I'll talk a lot more about new comedy and the differences between new comedy, old comedy, and middle comedy. Um, but Discolos gives us a good sense of what this genre actually involved. And so Menander has been, has been called the father of, of comedy uh, because what we get in new comedy and what we get in Discolos is a lot of the same kinds of things that would come to typify comedy throughout basically the rest of Western history. So Roman comedy, Commedia dell'arte, English Renaissance comedy, uh, melodrama, up, up through the ages, these sort of standard comic things. And we get this in Discolos. Uh, so Discolos means the way that this edition, the Oxford World Classics edition, uh, translated by Maurice Balm, uh, Balm translates Discolos as the bad-tempered man. Uh, I've also seen it translated as the misanthrope, uh, which I kind of like, even though it's there's a, a classical French play by the same title. Uh, but the play focuses on a conflict over love. Uh, we have uh, Sostratos, who is sort of wealthy, uh, sort of dilettante, man about town type figure, who goes out hunting in the country and he sees this girl who bizarrely enough we never learn her name she's the beloved but she's always referred to either as uh, Naaman's daughter uh, or um, da, 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 sorry, uh, Georgius's brother so uh, Naaman is a misanthrope he is sort of a hermit. He lives by himself on a farm uh, with just his daughter and an elderly servant. Um, and he basically has dedicated his life to not ever interacting with anyone uh, ever for any reason. So we get this because um, we're first introduced to Naaman when uh, he comes in uh, so Stratos has sent one of his servants to uh, go talk to the beloved's father, which is Naaman. Uh, the servant comes basically sprinting back in uh, because Naaman has been throwing dirt clots at him and chasing him off. And Naaman comes on and he says, Now Perseus, wasn't he a lucky man in two respects? He could take wings on high and never meet the men who walked on earth. And then he had this gift with which he turned all people who annoyed him into stone. I wish I had that gift. Then there would be no shortage of stone statues everywhere. But now life's not worth living. No, it's not. Men trespass on my land and chat to me. I usually waste my time, of course, beside the very road. Why, I don't even work that part of my estate. I've left that bit to avoid the passers-by. But now they chase me into the hills above. What swarming crowd? But help! There's someone, someone else standing beside my door. So basically, he comes on. Um, he, he, this reference to Perseus. Um, Perseus, when he went to uh, to fight Medusa, was given uh, Pegasus, uh, the winged horse, to ride. And then when he cut off Medusa's head, he could use that. He could sort of hold it up and I don't know, shield his eyes or whatever, sort of dabbing, I guess, if you're into pop culture if that's a pop culture reference. Um, but he could hold it up and, and use Medusa's uh, turning people into stone power 
uh, against his own enemies. So uh, Namos is, is wishing for those two abilities uh, in order to avoid ever having to talk to anyone for any reason. Um, and he, he is sort of pointing out here that he has specifically stopped working the land close to the road where people actually come uh, because he doesn't want uh, to encounter people. Um, so, uh, Naemon is not particularly keen on the idea of even talking to Sostratos, uh, much less having Sostratos marry his daughter. So, Sostratos uh, goes to Georgius, or, or meets, meets up with Georgius. Uh, Georgius is Naemon's estranged son. Uh, um, the girl's, I think, half-brother? Anyway, the girl's brother. Um, so Georgius and Sostratos attempt to come up with a plan to impress uh, Naemon, uh, which ends up not working because Naemon doesn't show up at the place. Um, meanwhile, uh, Sostratos's family uh, is coming to uh, um, to the Shrine of Pan, which is right by uh, Naaman's home, uh, because they're going to make a sacrifice to Pan. So there's the servant, Jitas, and uh, the cook, um, da, 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 let me find the cook's name, uh, Sikon, sorry. Um, so there's, there's Jitas and Sikon, and they each end up sort of going to uh, to uh, Naaman's house and bothering him and getting rather brusquely turned away. Um, but Jitas especially, actually both of these servants, but Jitas especially is a, is a particularly interesting figure in terms of new comedy because he's moving toward the figure of the wise slave, which gets sort of fully developed in Roman comedy. Um, so early in the play, so Stratos, uh, after getting turned away rather rudely by Naaman, reflects, this business requires, it seems to me, no common effort, something more serious. That's obvious. Jitas, my father's slave, suppose I go to him. By heaven I shall. He's a ball of fire, experienced in every kind of thing. He'll drive away all the old man's bad temper, I'm quite sure. So this idea of the slave, the clever slave, the wise slave, uh, the, the servant or, or whatever it is, who helps his master out and manages to sort of keep one step ahead of trouble is a really, really important figure for new comedy and, and carrying forward through uh, the Renaissance up to things like um, Jeeves and Worcester or uh, Beach in, in the Blandings stories and things like this. So uh, we have that figure. Um, so Georgius and Sostratos are attempting to figure out a way to impress upon Naaman that Sostratos would be a good son-in-law. Um, while they're doing that, the old woman who's, who is Naaman's servant has dropped a bucket down the well, and then she attempted to use a mattox, which is a farm tool, uh, to hook the bucket and pull it back out, at which point she lost that down the well as well. Um, Naaman, who's kind of a miser as well as a, a misanthrope, is not pleased with this. And so he attempts to get the bucket and the mattock out himself, at which point he falls into the well, and so uh, Sostratos and Georgius go to try and save him. Uh, according to Sostratos, Georgios does most of the work, um, and Sostratos basically just sort of looks at Naaman's daughter and, and doesn't really assist in any way. But uh, when they've gotten Naaman out, Georgius says, hey, this guy Sostratos, was instrumental in rescuing you from the well, maybe you should let him have uh, your daughter's hand in marriage. 
And so Naaman sort of reflects on his whole life, the the whole misanthropy thing. Uh, and he says, one mistake perhaps I did make, thought myself alone of all self-sufficient, never needing anything from anyone. Now I see that death may strike one swift and unpredictable, so I found how wrong I was then. Surely one must always have someone near to help. But truly I was quite unbalanced then when I saw, though men's lives differed, profit was their only goal. I imagined no one would ever show kindness to another, that it was that this it was that caused my blindness. Now one man and one alone, Georgius has proved my error, showing my true nobility. I'm the man who never let him near my door, who never gave him help at all, who never greeted, never spoke with courtesy. All the same, it's he has saved me. Any other man quite fairly might have said, you don't let me near, now I'll not come near to you. You yourself have never helped us, now, now I'll, I'll give no help to you. What's the matter, boy? He's addressing Georgius here directly. So whether I am now about to die, which I think is very likely, I seem ill, or I survive, I adopt you as my son, boy. All I own consider yours, I entrust my daughter to you, and you must find a husband for her. Even if my health were perfect, I'd not find one. None would ever satisfy me. As for Naaman, if I live, then let me live as I wish. All else take over, manage things yourself. You are sensible, thank God, and, take, and care for your own sister, as you should. Split in two all my possessions. Give one half to her as dowry. Make the rest support your mother and myself. So much for that. And then he addresses his daughter. Lie me down. I hold that no one should say more than he needs must. This, however, you must know. Certain things I wish to say of myself, my way of living. If all men behaved like me, law courts would exist no longer. Men would no longer haul each other off to prison. War would cease then. All would live content with less. But perhaps you find more pleasure in your present ways. Good luck. This bad-tempered misanthrope will no longer will be no longer in your way. So we have an interesting sort of reversal here, because on the one hand, Naaman is is sort of saying, uh, "I thought I was an island, and then I almost died, and I realized just how much I, I just how much everyone has to depend on." On others, how how crucial community is, and so because of that, I give you, I sort of dispense uh, the right to to uh, make decisions about my property and to select husband for my daughter, etc., etc. At the same time, he's saying, now I want to just go and be a hermit and have everybody leave me alone, but. You're now in charge of the, the financial side of things. Just let me go sit by myself, undisturbed, etc., uh, etc. Et so it's an interesting sort of reversal. So uh, the upshot of this ultimately is that Sostratos gets to marry the daughter, um, and he convinces his own father to let. Sostratos convinces his own father to let Sostratos's sister marry Georgius. Um, and he does this basically by making the argument that even though Georgius is poor, he's a good person, and that that should count for more than worldly riches, particularly since uh, Sostratos' father is, is pretty wealthy already. So then everybody is happy, uh, except Naaman, who of course is never happy, <laughs> um, and basically everybody goes in uh, to celebrate the sacrifice to Pan, uh, which involves a feast, except Naaman, who doesn't want to go to the feast. Uh, but Jesus and Sikon go and basically uh, torment him, basically just sort of show up and ask if they can borrow things, uh, refusing to leave Naaman alone until he agrees to go to the feast because it's less irritating to go to the feast and be around people than it is to have G Jadis and Sikon uh, irritating him in this way. So that's sort of the end of the, of the play. The other thing that's interesting about Discolos, and this is something that we get in, in new comedy more generally, in all other Greek drama, in, in 
5th century BCE tragedy and comedy, you have a chorus, and the chorus tends to play a pretty significant role. In Discolos, in New Comedy, they don't. Their, their role is almost entirely eliminated. So, Discolos has five acts, and the only time we have, the only time we really have the chorus involved at all is between acts, and all we have for the choral, we have a choral interlude. Um, and basically, it just says here, a chorus of worshippers sings and dances outside the shrine. There's not even a part written for the chorus. There's not even even uh, specific songs or odes or speeches that the chorus is supposed to give. They just show up and dance. And according to the introduction to this, again, Oxford World Classics edition, it's quite likely that the choral interludes weren't thematically even linked with the content of the play itself. <laughs>